All right. Uh, so there are a few things that I want to point out about this article. First thing I want to point out uh, is this part at the beginning here that's sort of an overview of what the article is saying. It's an overview of what's going on. Uh, and one thing I want to highlight is this sentence here. One of the major points that Dennis Lamoureux is making is that if we're reading the Bible, we have to recognize that it was written for the people of that time. And so he says right in the beginning, the Bible features an ancient conceptualization of nature. Uh, and so sometimes this leads people to think that you cannot have science and you cannot have religion together. And he gives a number of examples later on in the article about what are some of the ancient views of nature that we know now just aren't true. Uh, so that's one of the main points of the article, is that we're not saying the Bible isn't true, we're saying it was written for the people of that time. Now some of the things uh, that I want to point out specifically start on the next page. This point he's trying to dispel. He's trying to show that the word evolution and that the word creation don't have to be restricted where one means one thing and the other means the other thing. And that's a main topic of the entire article. I mentioned this too on Friday. They don't have to be mutually exclu exclusive. You can believe in evolution and you can believe in creation because they're not the opposite of each other. Uh, so one is atheistic and the other one is literal creation exactly the way the Bible said that it happened. The next thing that I want to point out, and this is one of my favorite things that he does, is that he makes a really good analogy between embryology, which is an obvious scientific thing, uh, and evolution. So he compares the way a baby develops to the way the earth was made and he points out a few very important things. The first thing that he points out is that both things were planned for a purpose. So when a fetus starts developing, when it's just a zygote, when it's an embryo and it's just a bunch of DNA, the end purpose is already there. And we're saying that that parallels the development of the earth, that it wasn't just randomly developing, but that there was, there was, a, way, there was a, a, a bigger picture that was in sight. The second thing is the idea about natural processes. He even says in the article that if you were to ask a Christian, or at least uh, someone of our faith, uh, do we think that God came into the mother's womb and put the nose on the baby and put the ear on the baby, we would say no, that almost sounds silly. It all started and it was predetermined. The genetic information was there and the baby developed through natural processes. And that's what evolutionary creationists are saying about evolution on the planetary scale. It's not like God came and was like, okay, now today I'm going to put a goat and the next day I'm going to put a fish. Things happened through natural processes uh, because of the starting point. So we mentioned the Big Bang here. The third thing is this idea of intelligent design. And I don't want you to mix up intelligent design theory necessarily with evolutionary creationism. There are people who subscribe to this evolution or this intelligent design that would not agree with some of the things Lamoureux is writing. What we're getting at is that th this is a pretty magical process. I don't think any of you would argue that the fact that a little st string of DNA can make a person is pretty amazing, like it's a pretty fantastic process, uh, and that there's something beyond our knowledge that is ordaining that this is the way that it should be. Now the next thing that I want to point out is a little bit later on. Uh, is this part right here. If you read this far, there's a really nice little analogy comparing God to a person who is playing a game of pool. So he's playing billiards. Uh, and what we're saying is that a lot of people assume that creation means that God was the person holding the cue, he hit the ball, and then every other ball sank mysteriously and magically just because of that first shot that he made. And what we're trying to say is, 
that the opening stroke was like the Big Bang. And then the universe started evolving life from that. But that God didn't come and make uh, little individual shots uh, to fill in the gaps. And so I thought that was a really nice analogy to something that you could relate to. Now there's another thing a little bit later on. Oops, where's my page thing? Where there's a nice little list. I'm going to go down here. There's a nice little list of things uh, that are ancient conceptions that appear in the Bible. And so I mentioned on Friday that the Bible is not a fact book. It is not a history book just telling you this happened, then this happened. A lot of it is written for the people of that time in poetic language. Uh, the other thing is that it features all these ancient conceptions. So for example, the earth is flat. That's, that's mentioned in the Bible. There's a whole bunch of uh, spots where you can see it, and we know that that's not true. Another idea, uh, that there is water all the way around the earth. Circumferential means all the way around the circle. Uh, the earth is immovable, which we know is not true. A solid domed structure holds up a body of water over the earth. Uh, and so this is very ancient conceptualizations of the way the earth and the planets and everything is all organized. Uh, that the sun is moving across the sky as opposed to the earth rotating and orbiting around the sun. So we've got all of these ancient views that help illustrate that we cannot read the Bible as a literal a portrayal of fact because it was written for people at that time. Now the other thing that I wanted to point out was that We'll get down here to where we got it. Uh, there's a bunch of examples in the article, like it says here, about ancient poetry. Uh, and so there's a couple of examples of the way things were written, uh, either in parallel form uh, or other types of poetry. And that this helps illustrate that the Bible is written in a figurative language in some places. It's not always literal language. So you've got an example here from Genesis about the story of creation, about how it's parallel. And then you have another example here about Noah uh, and the poetic structure. You can see it goes from A all the way to the center and back out to A, just in the way the numbers are set up. And so the thing I'd like to point out is this. There are some actual historical events in the Bible, things that really did happen, but in Genesis, when we're talking about the story of creation, because of all the poetry that we see there, it's calling us to read these passages not as literal facts of history, but as a literal interpretation of things that maybe the people of the time didn't have the knowledge to understand. And then the last thing that I want to mention is the very last sentence that's on the last page, which is this, and this sort of sums up the entire article here. The intention of the Bible is to teach us that God is the creator and not how creation happened. And his goal with this article is to show you that science can fill in the how, uh, and so we don't have to say either God created or evolution happened because both of them can be true. So I'm just going to pause here. So we are going to start today by talking about a guy named Jean Lamarck. In your textbook, page 123 and 124 uh, discuss uh, some things about his theories. Now, we are going to talk about Lamarck not because uh, I, I, I want to support his idea as being the correct one. But we're going to talk about him because he was one of the first people to propose a mechanism. In other words, he was one of the first people to propose how evolution might occur. Not 
that it did or that it didn't, because lots of people had already had that idea, but moreover, what caused it to happen? What were some of the processes involved in evolution? So I'm going to mention a couple of things about what he saw, and then I'm going to give you an example about how he would explain evolution. One of the things that's important to Jean Lamarck's theory is the idea of a line of descent. And here we're referring to the fossil record. So obviously, in our last class, we mentioned George Cuvier, who's the father of paleontology. He started discovering fossils and a whole bunch of things about fossils. And what Jean Lamarck noticed was that the fossil record shows progression. And so what we mean by that is he noticed that as fossils got older and older and older, and you looked at the same organism in the fossil record, there were differences, but they were progressive. Uh, and so he noticed that there would be slight changes over time to the different organisms that you would see in the fossil record. And so the idea of progression we could say is change over time. Depending on the age of the fossil, the fossil of a particular organism looked slightly different. It had different features in it. And so he came up with an idea about inheritance. His idea was the idea of use or disuse. In other words, acquired characteristics. His idea was that organisms showed progression in the fossil record depending on whether or not they used a particular structure or a particular function. And if they didn't, it would disappear from the fossil record. If they did, well then that's when it showed up in the fossil record. So down here I'm going to give you an illustration of a giraffe where Lamarck's theory tries to explain how giraffes ended up having long necks. We would start over here with the ancestor, and the ancestor has a short neck. And Lamarck's idea is that every successive generation, the giraffe stretched its neck. Now, why would the giraffe stretch its neck? Well, they are driven by need. They need to reach their food, which is high up in a tree. And so the idea would be that giraffes stretched their necks on purpose to reach the food. And that over time, there's the word progressive, Over time, the change was progressive, and eventually all giraffes had long necks. Now, on the surface, this seemed like a very logical explanation. You need food, and if you're driven by a need, perhaps you can cause change to your characteristics that will allow you to survive. So I want to point out a key word here, survival. When we talk about the other theory, Darwin's theory, I'll use the word survival quite frequently, but I just want to highlight Lamarck also agreed that organisms were trying to survive. Now, this sounds pretty logical, sounds like it makes sense. That's a logical explanation for how giraffes might have had long necks. but. It doesn't explain all of the possible scenarios. When we talk about De Lamarck's theory, there are some holes in it. There are some things that are unexplainable. So I already mentioned that characteristics can be acquired and the law of use and disuse. And the main idea is that 
An organism can change its body characteristics during its lifetime. So here's my little example. According to Lamarck's theory, here's what should happen. Let's say I take two cyclists. Here they are. We would assume that they would have really well-developed leg muscles from all of the bike riding that they do. It's a very sensible thing. Uh, it, that would be a logical thing to have happen if you ride a bicycle and use your leg muscles a lot. Now, let's say that these two cyclists get married and have themselves a baby. Should this baby be born with highly developed leg muscles? Well, according to Lamarck's theory, it should, because those two parents developed their characteristics over their life, lifetime by using them, uh, and that's what they should be passing on. That's what the giraffe example, I'll just go back to, that's what it's saying. Giraffe stretched its neck, and then the next generation, the necks were a bit longer. They stretched them more, then the next generation, the necks were a bit longer. So maybe with people as the example, you can see how silly this sounds. It sounds silly to say that I should be able to work out and have my baby come out with ripped delts because I exercised that. I'm going to give you a few other examples. Now I put down here weaknesses because the main weakness of Lamarck's theory is that the environment didn't cause directional mutations. And I'm going to explain that. Changes for a purpose, let's call them. So environmental conditions, like my food being up high in a tree if I'm a giraffe, has no effect on my DNA. There is nothing about a tree being tall that will affect my DNA and whether or not my neck is long or short. The environment causes mutations, that's for sure. There are things in the environment that can change your DNA, but the environment cannot cause directional mutations, this change for a purpose. The other thing is that organism need or desire doesn't change DNA and that it is only DNA in the egg or the sperm that really matters. And at this point in time, did we know all of this information? No. And so Lamarck's theory made some sense at the time without all of this background knowledge. So, some other examples that would help illustrate something that Lamarckian evolution would say could happen would be getting a tan. Getting a tan changes my skin cells. I look visibly different. I have different physical characteristics. But, even though the environment caused this change, so it was the sun that caused this change, it's not changing the DNA in the sperm or the egg cell. It's just affecting the appearance of my skin. It's probably not even changing the DNA in my skin to any great degree unless I'm tanning frequently uh, and without protection. But any of these characteristics that you can acquire during your lifetime, a tan, some sort of scar, an injury, all of those things, according to Lamarckian evolution, you should be able to pass on because you acquired them during your lifetime. And we know that that's not going to happen. I have a scar on my knee. My kid didn't come out with a scar on her knee because she didn't fall off of her bike like a dummy, riding with no hands on a bunch of gravel, uh, trying to be a show-off. So Lamarckian explanation made sense. At the time, perhaps without all of the background information that we have now about genetics and how DNA works. So we need to talk about Darwin. Now lots of you have probably heard the word Darwin, heard the name Charles Darwin. Maybe not a lot of you have heard about Wallace. He was another guy on this ship, part of this discussion. So just my advice to you, if you are going to discover something, make sure your name gets attached to it so that 
you're the one who gets the credit 300 years in the future. Poor Wallace here. Your textbook mentions him, you know, as a side note. Oh, yes, Wallace as well. Uh, but a lot of the time, he doesn't even get mentioned. So they were both developing this theory of natural selection. This is the theory that we are going to discuss. We're going to talk about what it is, how it was developed, how evidence supports that this could be a mechanism for evolution. Now, I do not expect you to memorize nor replicate this map. This map is available on page 124 of your textbook. Uh, but I'm trying to illustrate to you where Charles Darwin was, because he's a British fellow, uh, but he was certainly not investigating things uh, in Britain. He was traveling on a ship called the HMS Beagle. Maybe you'll be on Jeopardy one day. But around the coast of South America. So way, way far away, which is why he finds all of these unusual organisms that we're going to talk about. Specifically, He's in the Galapagos Islands, which are fairly famous. You've probably heard of those. And they're just off the coast of South America. So that's where they are. And he traveled to all of these different islands, and he did a ton of research, a ton of observation about not just evolution, but just how things worked in general and what organisms lived there and how they were adapted. And here's the main point. Individuals with traits, so characteristics, whether it was something about their behavior or their physical appearance, that helped them survive, were more likely to pass these on. There were competition because there were limited resources. And this selects, that's where we get the word in natural selection, this selects for individuals with favorable traits. Now, I think quite a few of you correctly came up with the main idea of the first point. Does someone want to share with me what they wrote for the first point, what Darwin saw, what the main idea is? Jake, why don't you tell me what you wrote, because you just said it to me, and it was, go it was good. So... I'm going to sum it up really quickly. Darwin was talking about, the, the example talks about rodents, and how he saw rodents all over the place, but that the environment they were in seemed to mean that they had different characteristics. So, he agreed, or he noticed, that there were similar organisms in one continent and another. So in Europe and in South America, he saw things that were rodents, but the environment seemed to be causing differences. He didn't, have, he didn't propose how yet here, just that he saw it. If you were in a different geographical area, organisms that were similar otherwise had differences in their characteristics, and that's a pretty important thing. So we might say environment, the word geography might get used here as well depending on where you are. Environment is probably a better word because it's not just talking about where you are on a map, but what are the conditions of that particular area. Now, the second point was where we show the example of the armadillo and the fossil that looks like the armadillo. And the point in this one is that fossils resemble living organisms. And the key word here is resemble. They're not identical, but they're very similar too. Even in Lamarck's theory, which we pointed out some weaknesses in, he recognized that there was progression, that over time it seemed like the characteristics of organisms changed, and finding fossils that look similar to but not identical to living organisms uh, supports that idea. Uh, now, the third thing uh, was about the Galapagos Islands specifically. So I'm just going to put this down. What he found on the Galapagos Islands were similar to 
the things in South America. So when you write an equal sign that's wavy instead of flat, you mean it's close to. Not identical, but close to. And so the first and the third point are both about geography. One of them is talking about how uh, separate continents seem to have very distinctive organisms. But the third point talks about how the Galapagos, which are very close to South America, have very, very similar characteristics if we talk about the organisms that live in the two places. So two points already about geography. The fourth point was about environmental adaptation, if I had to sum it up. You might have heard about these finches before. It's a fairly famous thing that Darwin studied when he was in the Galapagos Island. So I'm going to put this down just as an example here. Darwin noticed that these islands, the Galapagos Islands, seem on the surface very similar in their environment. But there are some slight but very distinct differences in the makeup of each of the islands. Uh, and then he looked at the birds that lived on all of these islands and realized that depending on which island he was on, they had different adaptations, different characteristics, depending on if their food source was going to be easy to access with a long beak or a short beak. Uh, and so within, this is within a very small area. So not just this idea of, okay, if I'm really far away, obviously organisms look different, but even in a really small area, if the environment was different, organisms had different characteristics that helped them to survive. In particular, he was looking at beaks and how the beaks were adapted to their food source. So that would be the illustrative example here, but the idea is changes in the environment resulted in adaptations. Now the last point uh, was about sexual reproduction causing variation. That's a point that hopefully you remember learning in grade 9 science. When two things reproduce or sexually, you get variation because there are two parents. If we use asexual reproduction, you're getting an exact clone of the original organism. Uh, and so he was just highlighting the idea or the fact that variation was possible. It was possible to have different characteristics every generation. And now we're going to talk about how these differences could be adaptations that could explain why geography seemed to cause such differences in the organisms that he observed and why fossils only resemble living organisms instead of being exactly the same as them. So the first thing I want you to recognize is that this is a process. This is not a thing that happens one time and then it's over. And that this process happens over time. And that's a key idea when we're talking about evolution, is that it's a process. It's not just one thing, it's a whole bunch of things. And it takes a long time for this to happen. So over here on the right, I have a little pedigree chart, basically. If you take Bio 30, we'll draw these at length, showing different generations. But the idea is that every time we go down a step, it's a new generation. So generation one would be, let's say that's you, and generation two would be your children. Generation three would be their children. Generation four would be your grandchildren's children, and so on. So each of these is representing a new generation, not the organism changing in some way. The first thing that Darwin and Wallace talked about in their theory of natural selection was the idea of overproduction. More organisms are produced by whatever method than can survive. Now this might not be particularly evident with humans right now, but even if you think about humans a hundred years ago, 
I know that it was fairly common talk, especially when I talked to my grandparents or when my great grandparents were alive, things that they would say to me. Uh, people would tend to have a lot of children because it was fairly likely that some of them were not going to make it past childhood. And so you wanted your family line to continue. I know in my family, a lot of people were farmers and you needed people to work your land. And so you had to have kids so that someone could continue working the land afterwards. Um, but the idea was that there was overproduction. For most species, even ours included, if we go back a little ways, there are usually more organisms produced or more organisms born than those that can actually survive. So if I take a look at my parent and my first generation, they have three offspring. Offspring is a very general term for the next generation. Now, in these three offspring, not all three of them are going to survive. There's not enough resources for all three of them to survive. And so we move on to the next point, variation. Mutation and or sexual reproduction causes differences. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that mutation is a bad thing. Most people, when they think mutation, think the three-eyed fish that you see on The Simpsons because of the nuclear power plant and the waste that it produces. But mutations are simply changes in an organism's DNA. They do not have to be bad. They also do not have to be enormous. A lot of DNA mutations don't even cause a different physical characteristic when you look at the organism. I will bet you all the money that I can gather that you have some DNA mutations and that it is not affecting your life in the least, chances are you have other mutations that have given you different characteristics, but mutation does not have to be bad. All we're saying is that your DNA is not identical to that of the generation before you either because of sexual reproduction where the DNA of two organisms is mixed together or because of mutation. So in this picture, it's illustrated by the color. A light one, a gray one, and a dark gray one. That's our variation. We're being very simplistic here. The next point is about the struggle for existence. In other words, competition. Competition for resources. Competition for mates. Now again, this might not be as evident in the human population, but it is to some degree. There are limited resources available. Uh, in our particular society, maybe we don't see that as often, but there is often not enough food to go around. And this can cause some organisms to be able to survive and some not. It's a little more evident in the wild where there's one source of water and tons of organisms that want to share it. Only the ones that are the best adapted to acquire the water or perhaps to win the competition for the water are going to survive. There's also a struggle or a competition for mates, especially in the wild. Organisms have all sorts of features that make them well adapted to attract a mate so that they can reproduce. So we notice over here the poor white colored circle that's representing one of the offspring didn't win the competition. They had an unfavorable mutation. So they had some difference that was making it unfavorable for them. So they were missing a characteristic that made them be able to compete for resources and to compete for mates. That means that in the next generation, now only the light gray and the dark gray ones are left. And notice how they are the ones who survive. And then they have, again, differences in their offspring. Some of them are lighter gray, some of them are medium gray, some of them are dark gray. So every generation will have overproduction, variation, and then the struggle for existence. So every time a new generation comes along, some of them will have characteristics that allow them to compete, and some of them will not. In the long run, 
So this here we have over time. Now this illustrates six generations. That's very simplistic. Evolution, the way we know it, usually takes way, way longer than that. But the idea would be that over time, whichever ca characteristic was favorable, gets passed on. Not because that DNA was easier to pass on, but because the organism who had it survived and was able to reproduce. And their offspring that also had it survived and were able to reproduce. So the idea here is the idea of reproduction. If you can survive long enough to reproduce, then your characteristics must be okay. They must be well suited for survival. Now with this same picture, I'm going to illustrate the other couple of points in their theory. Survival of the fittest. You might have heard this term before. That's a way to describe natural selection. And here we're saying only organisms with DNA that gives characteristics favorable to survival will live long enough to reproduce. So what we're getting at is that if you have characteristics that allow you to survive, then you're the organism who's going to pass on your characteristics. And those that have characteristics that do not help them survive won't be able to pass them on. Now, is this a hard rule? Of course not. Sometimes organisms survive because there's an abundance of resources and they don't have to fight for them. But what we're saying is over time, through a process, organisms that have DNA that gives them favorable characteristics should be able to pass that on. So you'll notice on the picture that I started out with this light gray colored circle. And at the end, all of the offspring were sort of darker gray in color. This is indicating a change. Notice how it didn't happen immediately. It happened over several generations and several processes and a lot of time. But the last thing that Darwin did was give an explanation for change and how this change could result in the formation of new species. So this is still part of natural selection. This is still part of what Darwin and Wallace were talking about. Uh, the word speciation means the formation of a new species. So that's speciation. Now, like the rest of natural selection, Darwin is saying that this happens slowly over time and that it's a process. But he recognized that there would be two types of evolution. Microevolution. Small changes in the characteristics of a population. So microevolution is something that we can see happening. A really good example of microevolution that we'll talk about again a little bit later on is the idea of moths. Perhaps you've heard this story before. Uh, the basic idea is that there's this thing called the peppered moth. And there are two colors, the light color and the dark color. And it used to be that uh, the light color were well camouflaged, hard for predators to find, and the dark color really stood out against light colored tree bark. Then the Industrial Revolution happened, and things became more polluted, and it turns out the black ones were more camouflaged, and the white ones were easier for predators to see. And what we noticed was a shift 
in the population. There were still light and still dark peppered moths, but now there's m there were more black ones than white ones, as opposed to more white ones than black ones. It's not a new species, they're still just moths, but there's a change in the characteristic in their, of their population, of how many of them are one color and how many are another. Macroevolution, I'm going to point out, is very, very slow. This would be the idea that there are enough differences now to consider a new species. And according to Darwin, this was due to geographic isolation. We'll see that there might actually be another way that a new species could form, but based on what Darwin observed, geographic separation seemed to be the reason that there were differences. So you'll notice over here I have an ancestor and we're illustrating how this ancestor could have given rise to two different species that exist now because of changes that are happening over time. 